Hello everyone, I'm Renee van der Avoord, the Assistant Curator of Canadian Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. We are connecting today in virtual space, but I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The AGO operates on the land of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation, which was also the territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. I am delighted to be here to help launch two books published by the Small Walker Press in 2020. The theme this year is invisibility and the two books published are the Dark Redacted, with artwork by Donna Soki and text by Gary Barwin. And the second book is Built to Ruin, Between Invisibility and Suburbia, with photographs by Alejandro Cartagena and text by Nicholas Hawk and Tim Conley. I would like to thank Derek Knight and Catherine Perrier for inviting me and for sending me these two beautiful books in the mail, which I, um, which were a great gift to receive in the middle of this lockdown summer. I was so inspired by both books and have taken um, sort of a free form approach to my presentation. I will speak first about The Dark Redacted and then Built to Ruin. And I have inserted some artworks from the AGO's Indigenous and Canadian collection into the presentation, which came to mind as I was reading. I hope you enjoy. The beauty of Gary Barwin's text is that you can insert your own experiences into it. It's evocative and generous that way. As I read, I found myself reflecting on my own invisible hippo of grief. The image of a scuba diver came into my mind. Someone very close to me suffers from depression and bipolar and all of the loss, isolation and invisibility that surrounds those illnesses. This person recently took up scuba diving and I have seen them thrive more than ever before. I'm not a diver myself, but phrases from Barwin's text took me underwater into what I imagined that solitary experience to be when you are at the mercy of the depths below you and why that might be so appealing and cathartic. As Barwin writes about loss, it is often pitch black deep ocean and predators lack eyes, so being invisible is not necessary. Live close to the surface and hide by producing dazzling displays of light. I imagine the measured sound of breathing through the equipment, a constant calming rhythm as this person I love navigates through cold and unknown depths. I imagine the amount of courage this takes and the loneliness of it too. The loss always right beside me, Barwin writes, six times my size, shh, I say, and it sounds like the wind, shh, I say, and it sounds like the sea, like breathing. So Barwin's text made me think of the work of Canadian artist Betty Goodwin and specifically her swimmer series from the mid 1980s. In these mixed media drawings, Goodwin addresses mortality, suffering, survival and other weighty aspects of human existence. Her experimentation with the figure as it relates to memory and mourning is palpable. Goodwin's swimming bodies often present opposites, transparency and opacity, weight and buoyancy, passage and obstruction, light and dark. Goodwin's work is corporeal, it refers to the body, and so does Barwin's text. He writes, inside us, how much emptiness? Could we fill a balloon with it, fly away? A heart works because it is empty and can fill with blood, though it feels like a memory. The heart is fist size, unborn, invisible like the hand of a swimmer, swimming in the dark, our rib cage a baby's crib. Inside, we're all cave, our sightless organs, moon-eyed creatures whose only mission is to live. Reading this about the invisibility of our own insides struck me. I recently had an ultrasound and was able to listen to one of my, my organs. It sounded surprisingly empty, yet to me, it was still alive, working. It sounded like the wind or the sea 
or like breathing. A reminder that blood flows through me, nourishing organs whose only reason is to keep living. While Barwin's text was very visceral, Soki's drawings are more psychological. In that way, they are an excellent pair. What struck me first about Donna Soki's drawings was the iPhone with the time of 541 on January 13th. That was pre-pandemic, that was midwinter, and to me it's a very daunting date to think back to and also to think forward to. Um, you know, we are closing in on winter during a pandemic and the stress is real. To me, the emptiness of the screen points to the emptiness we feel from technology, social media, virtual connection. The drawing of the phone reminds me how reliant we are on our technology, how this phone, this artifact, in so many ways defines who we are as a culture. Conceptually, it relates to the empty locket and it underscores the importance of photography historically, but also today. The locket is so analog, so physical, compared to our Instagram stories and, and the Facebook albums that we are so obsessed with looking at today. In Soki's landscape drawings, I feel immersed, invisible. In isolations, she captures balls falls arrested, stopped in time, a wintry scene that is dizzying in its depth and opaque. Is there a way into these woods? There is no entry point. To me, it reads as a wall of information and texture. And yet there is a wonderful economy about the way she works. The pure linear quality of isolated forms and textures makes me think of David Milne. Thrilled by the sights and sounds of nature, historical Canadian artist David Milne portrayed the outside world in unconventional ways, experimenting with paint to create an innovative style that was unique in the development of modern art. He's known for his simplified compositions and restricted palette inspired by whatever was surrounding him. I love that, that Milne embraces both reduction and in this work, all overness, and I see that in Soki's landscape too. The sense of touch is evoked in Soki's digital drawings. Here, shot, counter shot, self portrait as mother, we see beautifully rich textures in the bison's fur, which become abstracted fields of lines. They're almost topographic. Again, I feel immersed in a vastness of small organic forms. They're like snowflakes, but they're actually tufts of fur. And I remember the invisible buffalo Barwin writes so wonderfully about. And I remember his phrase, grief is a steady blizzard. In the introduction to Built to Ruin between invisibility and suburbia, Derek Knight quotes Rem Koolhaas's description of the generic city at its most versatile on its outer ring. This is refreshing in that when I visit Scarborough or Mississauga or my own native, my home hometown, Brampton, I see repetition, pattern, uniformity, anonymity. But I also see a cultural richness and the potential for growing old and settling in. To me, the future of these suburban areas can hold great potential and versatility. And in this light, I echo the sentiments of Nicholas Hawk, who in his, in his poetic intervention in the book states that before the reflection sun, inside the tower light, the city is potential following progress, nothing. Notwithstanding progress and potential, when it comes to suburbia, there are always questions of sense of place, community, cohesion, and belonging. As I engage with the photographs of Alejandro Cartagena, these notions flood my thoughts. Are the suburbs fair places to live? What impact does this type of urbanism have on one's psyche?
Cartagena's photographs represent the current Mexican suburb, suburban sprawl in the metropolitan area of Monterrey. The artist writes that he has learned of many misfortunes that new inhabitants are facing, as well as the ecological impact and the increasing distance between the urbanized city and these new fragmented cities in the peripheries. He notes that there's a sort of chaos um, that, is, that is occurring in Mexico in this regard. His photographs seek, speak to the struggle of following capitalist ideals while also striving for fairer and more livable cities. He represents this global phenom phenomenon through the local lens of the Monterey area. When I look at Cartagena's photographs, I also wonder what was there before? In my work in the Indigenous and Canadian Department at the AGO, we are always thinking about land, contested land, stolen land, broken treaties, resource extraction, extractions, displaced communities. The canon of Canadian art history is built on the landscape genre and the, the paintings of the group of seven specifically, colonial ventures into so-called untouched lands. But in fact, we know those lands belong to Indigenous people since time immemorial. And we know that by the time the group of seven painted there, industry had already ravaged many resources. In my curatorial practice, I cannot isolate such uh, political and historical lenses from, from the work I do. And any landscape I, looked at, I look at is inflected by the question of of who or what was there before. Before is one of the words Nicholas Hawk builds into his poetic device in the photo legends at the bottom of each page of this book. Each phrase contains the words or variations of inside, outside, before, and after. In some cases, the text has been reworked and their terms are made invisible. What richness, human, animal, or spirit, existed on this land before? Cartagena's photographs of open, unused expanses, massive empty roadways, and housing projects draw out these thoughts for me. They remind me of another work in the EGO's collection, which is The Pines from 2002 to 2004 by Anishinaabe artist Robert Houle. Located near a burial ground, the Pines is an important center for the Ganyagaha or Mohawk community. Hu painted the Pines as a way of remembering the spiritual energy he felt when he visited. In 1990, the Pines became the site of the Mohawk resistance or the Oka crisis. When community members tried to block the town of Oka's proposed golf course expansion into the burial ground, the pines remained contested land, but the resistance had a galvanizing effect and united nations in their protection of sacred places. Houle's work underscores both the communal and the spiritual values of land, crucial factors that are not accounted for in the suburban sprawl um, all over from Oka to the metropolitan area of Monterey to the greater Toronto area. In his essay, Excavations, Tim Conley describes the suburbs as ruins of tomorrow ready-made today. They are ruins of our own making, pre-doomed to be cleared away and replaced. They are expressly impermanent, expressly wasteful. Whereas Mexico's ruins are vital to understanding the nation's origins and what came before, what ruins do we have in Canada and the US? Conley quotes Carlos Fuentes, in the United States, the ruins were merely mechanical, the ruins of promises kept and accomplished and left behind. One can't help but think of Detroit and the expanses of abandoned homes now attracting tourists vying to explore unused buildings, modern day ruins. Both books, The Dark Redacted and Built to Ruin have given me pause. The Dark Redacted allowed me to reflect on my own corporality, my own grief, 
and the invisible phenomena, both heartbreaking and celebratory, that surround me every day and that are innately within me. Built to Ruin has provided a window in, into uh, contemporary landscape art and the potential of political interventions via art making. The book has reframed the notion of suburb as ruin in the making, twisting temporality on its head and sparking questions of fairness, health and freedom. Both books resonate strongly with the work I do at the AGO and have resonated with the artworks in the collection that I am extremely privileged to work with. Thank you all for listening and um, wishing you a happy book launch.